Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Please check out my website, paulbeckwith.net, and consider making a donation to assist my work in just getting the message out to as many people as possible about the science of abrupt climate change. You know, what I try to do is I go through all of the complex uh, science and I try to distill it in a f and present it to you in a form um, that's easily understandable to people with no scientific background. So that's what I see. Um, and, uh, you know, basically I take all of the information, collective information that I know about climate change and try to figure out what's going to happen, how much time will pass before certain things happen, you know, and we're rapidly heading to a, a completely open Arctic Ocean with no sea ice and a ramping, huge ramping up of extreme weather events and a uh, global food crisis. Uh, we're, we're already, you know, it's, it's, the signs are clearly there. And when you're heading somewhere at very rapid speed, you're going to reach there unless you change course. So, you know, getting all this information to you, I think is very important because we need, we need to treat this as a climate emergency. I've been saying this for many years and lots of people around the world are starting to talk that way. And we need to deploy solar radiation management techniques and carbon dioxide removal techniques and methane um, te techniques to try to uh, bring our planet back to a more stable um, region. So this is part two. If you're watching this video and you haven't seen part one, I, I recommend going back and watching one first, but they're all kind of standalone videos. So let me continue um, analyzing the uh, most significant events um, that I that you know that I've um, noticed in the last uh, few months with climate change. So uh, at the end of the last video, I was shocked talking about the um, the CO2 concentration increase. So this is uh, 2019 versus 2018. It's compared on a weekly basis. So this is the um, this is the 2019 numbers. This is the 2018 numbers for the first um, four months of the year. And the, thick, the, the thicker, the, the, the higher the blue uh, bar, blue rectangle there, the larger the CO2 increase. So we're seeing, there is variation, but the average is uh, significantly high, uh, higher than, than previous years. I mean, look at the difference here in this month, for, in this week, for example, 4.48 ppm different from the same week last year to, um, to, to this year uh, for the end of April. Okay, this is, um, let me uh, start over here. Um, okay, so this is a daily precipitation, normal daily precipitation around the planet. Um, this is World Climb V.2 data, data set. Um, this is very, very dry, and as you go to you know, from the, the browns are very dry, and as you go through the colors to darker and darker colors, you is an increase in precipitation. So you can see, uh, for example, you know, you can see this is the equator area here, okay? Um, the intertropical convergence zone goes through here. There's lots of precipitation, and these are the desert regions, and what you can see is, you know, as the sun, um, as we go through the different seasons, um, you can see, uh, let me increase this to full screen. Yeah, okay, so what you can see, let's start it again. Okay, so from the beginning of the year, okay, so you can see uh, the, you know, the desert regions are where the Hadley cell descends, so you get hot, humid air, and um, you can see this desert, you know, the dryness coming up here as the sea, the seasonal dryness, a band here of, of a lot of rainfall. Um, you can see, uh, you know, very dry areas in the poles. They're mostly uh, deserts, basically, in terms of precipitation. Um, and uh, so you can see basically how these bands change. And one of the things that we're seeing is an increase in desert desertification. So the deserts are actually expanding. And on the fringes, there's very marginal 
farming on the fringes and if as the deserts expand those regions um, decrease. So this is very important to look at things like this in terms of uh, glo global food supply. So you, what you do is you match something like a map like this on the precipitation with the um, with the regions of the planet that are producing crops and look at the marginal margins of these dry areas expanding and you can see how uh, crops can be can be affected. I'll just play this uh, once more. Okay, these so if you look uh, for example, you know, we've been focusing here. If we look at North America, you can see the, uh, you know, wet, the wetter areas are coming in, the rain bands are coming up, and there's the only dry areas are in the far north of Canada and in the uh, southwest uh, deserts of the U.S., for example. You know, and then as the seasons change, the dry areas can expand in the winter and push out the, uh, you know, the areas with rainfall. Okay, so, you know, you can look at Australia, you can look at any particular region where you are, and then, you know, this helps you to understand the, the patterns of uh, changing precipitation. So, okay, um, let's have a look at the Arctic sea ice. Um, and a, uh, this is from 1979, which is the start when we started getting good cover coverage of sea ice monitored from sensors on satellites from space. So we've got sea ice extent, so that's 15% ice or more, and we've got the average Arctic Ocean uh, air temperature. So air temperature is just over the Arctic Ocean. And uh, this is the, the, the seasonal cycle. So this will be the maximum temperature, minimum temperature. This is a zero line, so you can see in the summer, temperatures over zero in the Arctic, and it's increasing more and more, but it is somewhat moderated by the latent heat effects because ice is melting, right? As long as there's sea ice, this uh, number is pegged close to zero. As soon as the sea ice goes, this number skyrockets. So the reason, since this is averaged over the whole Arctic, what you can see is, you know, there's a slow increase um, because the areas of open water are increased let's let's go to full scale for this full screen okay um, so this is the image this is the medium extent is the yellow line um, it's cycling through the months and you can see you know how the ice waxes and wanes from from summer um, through through winter um, and the temperature is dropping okay the or sorry, this is the ice extent is dropping, but this is the temperature rising. Okay, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and this is the maximum extent of the ice and the minimum extent. So everything is dropping, okay, in terms of the extent. So the big question is when will this extent go to zero, right? It's a very nonlinear exponential drop. But these, uh, the, these um, ways of showing the data are very, very useful to explain to people, uh, you know, what, what is happening. So they're, they're excellent, um, excellent um, GIFs and, uh, and uh, illustrations to show exactly what is going, down, going on in, in the Arctic in this case. The, European, um, the Europeans have a satellite European Space Agency has a cryosat satellite that's measured, it was launched um, about eight years ago. So it shows eight winters, the thickness of the ice through the winter season. So you can see um, what's happening here. This is the ice thickness is here in terms of meters. Okay, so zero up to five meters, the yellow is five meters. There's a couple of years here where there's some yellows Notice, tw remember 2012 was the minute was a year of minimum sea ice in the Arctic in, in September. So the years after that, the ice grew in the winter, um, you know, a lot more, more thickly, or at least thicker ice was pressed and ridged against the, uh, ridged up against the Canadian archipelago. And, uh, you know, that's the narrow strait that you can see that I was talking about. Greenland's over here. Okay, so you can see that sort of trends um, here and basically, you know, it's it's a bit difficult to tell from here, but the ice 
is definitely uh, thinning out. We're losing rapidly not just sea ice area, but sea ice extent, sea ice thickness, and therefore uh, sea ice volume. Um, there, we're getting uh, lots of, you know, these, these mega fires, massive fires, the updraft is so strong, the fires are so hot, the winds are above the fire, are updrafting, convectively uplifting so quickly. And, you know, there's a lot of moisture, water vapor in wood. So when wood is burning, you know, and grass is burning, that water vapor that's within the organic material, the plant, the trees, the grass, etc., goes up and, and is convectively uplifted too. And it will cool down with altitude and condense, and you can get these pyrocumulus clouds forming. You can get this. Uh, so the actual fire itself causes, not only does it cause the smoke plume, but you get lots of water vapor coming up, condensing into clouds, and you get these massive thunderstorms. You can have downbursts far away and embers going there. You can have uh, big pieces of burning wood still hot and uh, being carried and then dropped elsewhere, causing fires far away. You can get lightning generated from this storm, igniting fires, you know, 20 miles away was in one case of the Fort McMurray fire. So they're fire-driven thunderstorms with tornado-like winds. Um, they can cast these flaming embers three miles away from the actual whirl. Uh, and uh, you get this pyrocumulus cumulonimbus cloud form where you can get downbursts and you know sometimes the rain is quenched by all of the ash but you can still get lots of lightning so lightning from the storms without rain you know that's going to ignite other fires farther away plus it's a, it's lofting all kinds of ashen water vapor up into the stratosphere generally this would be the level of the upper atmosphere the troposphere the part of the lower atmosphere where all the weather happens but you get clouds um, pushing because the uplift is so heavy, so fast, you can get these clouds breaking through the tropopause, going up into the stratosphere where it takes them a long time for things to settle. So this, you know, a bunch of these fires together can have climate, can change the climate globally, you know, like a massive uh, volcano. I talked about the El Nino changes um, recently. So, um, so this is the, uh, we're getting a lot more of the Central Pacific type El Ninos, and we're getting um, the Eastern Pacific El Ninos are happening about once every 15 years. 1997, 98 um, was one of the strongest. 82, 83 was very strong. 2015, 2016, very strong. That's these type of um, Eastern Pacific El Ninos, but the frequency of occurrence of these guys is happening much more often. <clears throat> okay, so the strongest ever Eastern Pacific events, like I said, are 97, 98, 82, 83, and then 2015, 2016. So as bad as the recent one was, it's only the third strongest. Roughly every 15 years we have these events. The Central Pacific, also known as uh, El Nino, also known as the El Nino Modaki, uh, used to be every nine years. Now it's about every 3.3 years. So this is a, so climate change is definitely shifting the nature of El Ninos. This is um, Arctic air temperature um, by month. So one, so the, this is through the years. One is the warmest for that particular month. So you can look at recent year, you know, you can see as you shift here, we're getting more and more reds and deeper and deeper reds. This uh, was the El Nino year. The, these three months and then these three months were the hottest ever, okay, um, during that strong El Nino year. Um, 97, 98, there were some uh, hot years relative to previous, and 82, 83 was also a strong El Nino. But you can see the superposition of the El Nino on the background warming is causing all these record warm events here. This is quite interesting. You know, this was 2-2, two, 2-3-2 two, two, um, in 2018, but there was a couple cold months here globally. So this is, this, uh, this is significant. I think this needs to be looked at as to why, why this was the case. Um, so uh, anyway, thanks for listening, and I'll continue.